Hey, Bluegrass fans, this week's episode of the Fretboard Journal podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Dying Breed Music. I love Dying Breed not only because they sponsor this podcast, but also because they are one of the most customer-friendly vintage guitar dealers I've ever worked with. Lane over at Dying Breed keeps getting amazing flat-top guitars from the golden era as well. Right now, he has a 1942 Martin D18 with a few repaired cracks and re- replaced tuners, which means you get all the tone and volume from a Martin Dreadnought that you'd want from the right era, but with a price that us mere mortals can afford. He also has a 1935 Gibson Jumbo, one of the first Dreadnought shapes ever done on a mass-marketed guitar and a lot more. Give Lane a call over at 877-818-34 if you ever have any questions about his guitars or you want to hear more about his consignment program. And by all means, if you do reach out to him, and you do have any questions about guitars, tell them the Fretboard Journal podcast sent you. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindy. My bags are packed. I'm headed to the annual NAM trade show down in Anaheim, California. But before I go take the cab to SeaTac, I wanted to get this podcast out the door because today I'm talking to Hot Rise, the legendary bluegrass band. They are celebrating their 40th anniversary this month, actually, and uh, they are incredible. And uh, as if their bluegrass legacy wasn't enough, I think they are the only four-piece band of any sort in the world where every member has appeared in the fretboard journal at one time or another. Let me see how good my memory is. Tim O'Brien was on the cover of the fretboard journal 19 with Sam Bush. They interviewed each other. Nick Forrester interviewed Leo Kotke for us in issue 38. Pete Wernick was featured on his own in the Fretboard Journal 29, I think. And Brian Sutton, this one's easy to remember, is the cover of our current issue, issue 40, which is available now. So um, there you have it. And yes, if, you're, if you want to be uh, detail-oriented, oriented, Charles Sawtell, has also, his guitar was featured in the Fretboard Journal 20, I think. So yes, we've covered them all, and uh, we will probably cover them all even more so in the near future. But... Um, I wanted to get these guys in. They were playing a show at C- in Seattle. They are road warriors. Uh, they continue to enthrall audiences. They continue to deliver one of the best bluegrass shows around. And yes, their alter ego, Red Knuckles and the Trailblazers, keeps following them around too. So we talk a little bit about that on this podcast. I'm glad they were able to come here. We're going to have some video of these guys as well in action going on fretboardjournal.com. No other big plugs to uh, really announce today. Please subscribe to the Fretboard Journal magazine if you haven't yet. We're about to send out our 41st issue, so now is a great time to join us so you get the magazine when everyone else does and you don't feel left out. Uh, You can use that coupon code podcast and save a few bucks off your order. And uh, if you haven't seen our latest Bill Frizzell video uh, by all means, head over to our website and check it out. He's playing Paul Motions. It should have happened a long time ago, and it is truly beautiful. One of my favorite videos we have done to date. Uh, while I am at NAM, if you guys are not going to be at NAM, please follow us uh, at Instagram on Instagram at Fretboard Journal. That is going to be the best way to see all of our NAM highlights as I see them and as our small team sees them. Um, we're going to be posting fast and furious. So if you want to feel like you're there. Follow us on Instagram. I'm going to be back next week on the podcast, of course, interviewing singer-songwriter Bruce Coburn. We had a great chat that covered a lot of bases. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, in the meantime, here is my talk with the guys from Hot Rise. Guys, thanks for coming out to the Fretboard Journal. Thank you. 40 years of Hot Rise. I had no idea you'd have such palatial offices. It's pretty big, I know. Yeah, I'm glad the valet was able to get your car and yeah. bring you out here. Pete, what was the very first gig we had? What day was it? Day January 18th, 1978. Okay, so that's we're, tomorrow. That's tomorrow will be our anniversary. Damn. So this is the last day of our 40th year. Is that right? No. Yeah, it's no. the last day of our 40th year. Yes, that's right. Also, <laughs> first, last day, 1978, January 18th, is the last Sex Pistols gig. Wow. So Just mentioning it. It's yeah. for other people to say whether they pass the torch to us or not. I won't try to say that. <laughs> Let your readers decide. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was the scene in Colorado like back then, and where were you guys at in life? Well, everybody was a lot younger. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot fewer buildings in Boulder, and uh, we were... Bluegrass already had been around in Colorado. Bill Monroe had started a festival a few years before that. Telluride was going, but it was a relatively new thing, and... Uh, we were the first 
um, band. Well, actually, there Charles Sautel had been in one called the Monroe Doctrine that traveled around a certain amount. But we had ambitions to hit all over the place, around the country, be on the radio and everything. And uh, that made us fairly unusual. <laughs> in Colorado, in the Boulder area, uh, we found the the places where we were hired to play that were bars. Uh, they loved that we could bring in people, but they didn't like that they would sit on the dance floor and not drink booze. They had other things they would sample outside and then come back in and want orange juice. And that made us not very welcome in the bars after a while, but we found ways to play around town. The Left Hand Grange Hall in Niwot was our home base for a long We taught time. some of our audience to drink. That's right. That helped. <laughs> you drove them to drinking? I also want to say that we... Uh, we were really influenced by and kind of helped by this amazing institution called the Denver Folklore Center. Mm -hmm. And the Denver Folklore Center in, started in 1962 in Denver in a modeled after the New York Folklore Center and, and other sort of folk, uh, folk music community hubs. But the Folklore Center in Denver was such a powerful hub of the wheel for so many creative people and so many bands and artists. And, it was actually like six or seven contiguous storefronts with a concert hall, wow. an instrument repair shop, a retail shop, a bead shop, a record store, a music school, you know, and about 30 people went to work every day. And that was, um, in many ways, how we came to be connected. I worked in the repair shop. Tim and Pete would organize. I mean, Tim would occasionally teach in the music school, but Pete and Charles had a had a weekly bluegrass gig with their band uh, in the concert hall, and, and it, it became the community that we all just participated in. Also known as the folk industrial complex. Yeah. <laughs> did that guys did that bring you guys to Colorado originally, or was it that just me a... to Colorado because I got hired by the Folklore Center to work in their repair shop, so I moved from New York okay. in 1975 to work at the Folklore Center. Yeah. And where were you before that? I was in the Hudson Valley. Okay. I was living up around Rhinebeck. Just and, repairing? Yeah, I was working on a farm and playing in bands and doing guitar. I was doing inlay, uh, you know, abalone mother pearl inlay for a music store in the neighborhood, but yeah, not seriously. I was 18 or whatever, you know. We had a story on Harry and the the Denver folk store a long time ago. I imagine the way you describe it, it's more like what uh, is in Chicago now, right? The old town, the old town school folk. Is it kind of that kind of a vibe? Or? Yeah, but you know that it had a. It was more all-encompassing because it had a retail component. That, you know, that's where you went to buy the records that were like blues records and yeah. jazz records and cool old old records and the music, the uh, the bead shop that was just, you know, it made it um, more inclusive and anybody coming through Denver would go to the Folklore Center. One-stop shopping. Yeah, to buy strings, <laughs> buy records, get their guitar worked on. You know, buy some. You know, buy something as a gift or whatever. But anyway, that's. An, I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah. Was in there. And and how has your set list evolved over those years? Like, did the repertoire change a lot in the early years? Well, we started, um, you know, we, we wanted to play some traditional music always. Um, and, uh, you know, we had our own way with it, obviously, even though we were trying to keep it in the pocket of traditional bluegrass. But we also knew that if we could write some songs, we would um, make ourselves unique and maybe then we could get more jobs, I guess. So we worked on that. And when we were making rec getting ready to make a record, we, we kind of really turned on the heat a little higher and, and wrote some songs. And that, came, that became a, um, a, a good thing for us, and we just continued with that. And we were always looking for songs from outside of bluegrass, whether from earlier antecedents like old time and folk music, you know, the old ballads and fiddle tunes and that kind of thing, as well as songs from contemporary music. Like one of the first songs we would play would, uh, when we started was one that, I sang on a Pete Wernick record called Wichita Lineman, for instance. He had an arrangement on the banjo. So we, had, we were open to that kind of thing. And um, we also uh, would play a little Western swing and honky-tonk music. And um, we never were very successful at that until we, well, we, we kind of, we kept playing it until we met these other guys and they took over from us. Thank goodness. And, wh and when did those guys uh, join the, uh, the set? They came into the picture about two and a half years in. Um, they sound a lot like what we were doing, except they looked a lot better. Mm. They had the appropriate this, outfits. Maybe believable. they maybe they looked a lot like us, but they sounded a lot better. I'm not sure which one, one it was. It's really honesty when it comes down to it. <laughs> they talked slower, for one thing. They <laughs> talked <laughs> And Red Knuckles the, and the Trailblazers we're talking about. And whose idea was it to let them uh, on stage with you guys, or share the stage with them? They actually got their own radio show pretty early on. 
uh, at KGNU, it seems like. Didn't they? Have, didn't the Trailblazers have their own uh, segment? I, I, I'm, I'm, I've made sure my radio was off during that time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Charles Sautel who had the idea that it would be better if we would just leave the stage and have the Trailblazers come on looking like Trailblazers. Okay. Because we would play some of that same music and it just wasn't as convincing. Yeah. But when they came on and did it, it was more convincing, I guess. And plus, we got to rest. So now folks expect it at a Hot Rise show. What was that very first gig like when they came out? Not much different from the other gigs. <laughs> Actually, it was different because <laughs> it was like we created a monster. Uh, mm. And um, we... Hankenstein. Uh, Hankenstein, yeah. And then there was like a... I remember in... Uh, there was a... There was an interviewer in Louisville, Kentucky, named Ronnie Lundy, a, a music journalist and food journalist there, who wanted she really wanted to interview the Trailblazers, and of course, we didn't know their story, so they uh, interviewed the Trailblazers, and we finally heard their story. We did hear that particular interview, <laughs> and you learned a lot. We learned a lot, yeah. Oh, there's so much to learn. Yeah, yeah. That's why you have your magazine. I know. You so, even had one of the Trailblazers in your magazine. Uh, there was a picture of Waldo Otto in there, which... <sighs> I mean, he, he had one thing where he stopped doing it after a while, but just for a laugh for show business, he'd take his, his bar, his steel bar, which he calls a metal block, and he'd just throw it on the strings and then catch it as it bounced off up in the air. Now, that's not very respectful, is it? No, it's kind of that a cool, nice like Martin Gene Cooper D. move, though. Yeah. Oh, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> he just—he was not an acoustic string player, <laughs> as far as I know. So uh, you guys just played a couple songs for us, and uh, I'm noticing a lot of familiar instruments. You guys have been using. You guys are kind of monogamous when it comes to your hot rise gear, right? I, I've only had two banjos since I was 20 that I used as my main banjo. I'm 72 now, so yeah. Uh, the first one lasted from 60, 1966 to 1988, and then I got this new in 1988. It's a Granada made by Gibson. I'm the only owner. And, and, and when was it built? 1988. 1988, okay. Greg Rich. Yeah. And uh, Tim, you had your nugget. Yeah, I'm not playing the old one. I, I got the, that nugget from uh, Nugget Mandolins. He was living in Colorado then back in, uh, I guess I got it in seventy six it says 1976 on the inside he wrote it the date in there and then it took him a while to finish the mandolin but um, this one I'm playing now is I think built in 2003 okay how did the two compare they uh, compare pretty well um, the other one kind of went to sleep a little bit but uh, it's, it's actually a lot more modern in the way it's set up it's got a radius fingerboard and uh, it's, it's not as wide a spacing between the strings and stuff and um it's uh, it still sounds like a nugget, and it's a good axe. I really like it. Yeah, and uh, and you, Brian, had the guitar that was on the cover of the Fretboard Journal. Sure, yes, yeah, the thirty six D twenty eight that I got uh, in late what would that be two thousand sixteen. And <clears throat> talking about monogamy, I, I made a decision. I usually am in the guy that's always looking for the next one. I was gonna say, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. monogamy with guitars, Brian Sutton. I don't think so. I'm not gonna even try to claim that, <laughs> but I will say that I have made an effort over the last year to commit, and so far so good. You know, it's amazing when you do the work. When 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 the couple does the work, the relationship <laughs> gets better. <laughs> But yeah, that guitar, it's not, what, what I committed to was to try to give that guitar a couple of years, really, of just uh, some hard play. It, it, it was like to what Tim was saying, it was kind of asleep when I got it compared to what I think it could be. Okay. And it has been opening up as I've played it. When I got it, it had just had a new bridge plate and bridge and neck set, and, and it just sounded like that. It sounded like there was a lot of stuff going on in there, but it was in there and it needed to be out of there. So I'm, little by little, I feel like the guitar is really... Uh, you know, starting to be more responsive and open up and all this kind of thing. So, it's good what to, good what to was uh, what was the initial thought that made you? Why did you originally think that might be the guitar for you if it was kind of closed off like that? Well, you know, part of my experience with Hot Rise has been sort of listening more as a bluegrass player, playing the same songs, you know, every night over years of in spans of time of doing the show. I've never been in a situation like that. And just to really feel that, you know, my sound is such an integral part of what the four of us are doing, you know, where before or other opportunities I have, it's a, you know, it's a big machine and I may still be part of it, but, you know, I could not play and there would still be a pretty effective thing. 
if the guitar goes away or when the guitar goes away in a hot rise sound, it's, you know, there's a big hole there instrumentally. Anyway, all that to say, it's just I've, I've used that opportunity over the years to sort of just assess my own bluegrass guitar playing and the role of, of guitar and bluegrass and just trying to find that right, that right thing that feels like me, feels like it uh, is the one guitar that I feel like I could stick with for a long time. Uh, and you know, anyway, just playing with these guys really helps just kind of continually assess that. But this guitar here, uh, through you know years of discussions with Nick about 30s D28s, and I've kind of fought the 30s wide spacing for years, sticking to more of the early 40s, 111 16ths. But I played uh, guitar for a while, built by built by Caleb Smith, mm -hmm. a buddy of mine over there in North Carolina, uh, with the one and three quarters neck, and I really sort of made the transition. And, and then I found this guitar. Kind of just the timing of it worked out where this this became available, and it's you know it's a player's love of guitar. It's not like a thirty six collector's item. It's it's the it's the thirty six that's made to you know throw on Southwest overhead <laughs> bins and things like that. And I put a pickup in it. You know, I did all the things you're not supposed to do. But I figured you know it's my guitar. Um, and like to Nick's point, when I was talking to him about that, should I put this pickup in it? He goes, Well, you're not going to make it any worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's technically with, with the new bridge and the plate and the neck set and all the stuff. You know, it's a player's level guitar, and yeah. you know, hopefully, just me playing it will make it better and make it, you know, uh, if and when I ever do part with it, will you know make it a, a valuable thing for for somebody down the road. But anyway, that's the long story. All right, and Nick, you have your share of guitars and and basses. I do. I have ambulance. some guitars and basses, but um, in Hot Rise, I've only had two. Yeah. Um, well, maybe three. I had. Uh, I started out with a. Uh, I think it was a '71 Precision bass with a, a maple fingerboard that. When these guys asked me to, to play the bass in Hot Rise, I said, because we had been friends and we'd played a bunch of music together, but in general I would play other instruments. Um, I said, sure, oh, that sounds great. I don't have a bass. And they said, that's okay, we have one. And I said, okay, great. And so that was the bass. It was a 71 P bass. Yeah. It was, it, it was really funny because it also, um, it went away just as mysteriously as it came into my life. Um, <laughs> I bought it over time. You yeah. know, I paid. I had. I bought the instrument from, I guess, the band or Charles, and then uh, I think it was two hundred fifty bucks. Anyway, uh, and then when uh, we we migrated to this other, this is an old uh, mid '60s, you know, P bass that was uh, used to belong to a guy named Vic Garrett up in Aspen, and Charles bought it from Vic, and then it came into the band. And um, when that one started coming into service. Um, I had left my bass over at Charles's house, and one day he just said, "Oh, hey, by the way, I sold your bass." <laughs> <laughs> really? I said, "Yeah, it's it's uh, Jim Watson from, uh, you know, he's from Red the Red Clay, Clay Ramblers, and now he's playing with Robin Linda Williams. He's he he was looking for one, and I sold it to him. So uh, I've got you know four hundred dollars for you or whatever it was." Wow. All and right. I said, oh, "Okay, <laughs> thanks," and uh, <laughs> and I never saw it again. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that was. Um, so Charles and I started sharing this old 65, but I do a thing with my right hand where the way I play the bass in Hot Rise, my, my ring finger is kind of doesn't have anything to do. It's just kind of flopping around. Okay. So I dig a ditch in the instrument, and I just started doing that on Charles's, you know, it was technically his 65 bass, and uh, I started digging a ditch in it. And he said, okay, game over. Go get your own bass. <laughs> so I bought a copy, uh, a reissue, of a of a mid '60s, which I used for a couple of years, and when Charles died, that that bass came back to me full time. But yeah, and I'm digging a ditch in it. Good. <laughs> Was there always electric bass in Hot Rise? Yeah, that's the that's the way Pete heard the band. That's the way. Pete back heard in it. Uh, in 1977, when the band concept came together. Uh, I had been in Country Cooking, which had an electric bass, and it was more for the convenience factor, mm -hmm. and uh, which is huge. Actually, back then it was huger than it is now, I think, to have an electric bass because you didn't have any big vehicle to carry it in, and uh, it was consistent. You could always hear it for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then the question becomes how it's played. and. Any ins any good instrumentalist just needs to make sure their sound blends with what's going on around them. And though the prescription in bluegrass is for an acoustic bass, an electric bass can fit beautifully into it. And even people like Jim and Jesse and Jimmy Martin had used electric basses on occasion, sometimes with good results, sometimes less so. When Nick 
picked up the bass and started playing it, he learned how to play it in, in, in a way that it's got to be an electric bass, but it has a lot more in common with an acoustic bass than most electric bass players have. And it's part of the way he just, where, where he hits the string and just his attitude about it almost. Yeah. I would, I would echo that as far as, I think in bass playing with bluegrass, a lot of people sort of are insistent and, you know, are playing their bass. Mm -hmm. And Nick more or less plays music on the bass. I, I look at that as a different thing where mm -hmm. the fundamental is there, but he's listening and he's reacting, and especially from the rhythm guitar chair, mm -hmm. to just feel like we're kind of weaving this little narrative through songs and arc and, and dynamics and things like that. That's a defining factor of, of the hot rise bass sound to me. Yeah, we kind of existed in a vacuum in a way, or at least uh, I think Nick, what I'm trying to say is that Nick invented his own way into it. And, uh, and it, because he was playing with us, it just suited us so well. I mean, he really invented that. There was a guy in Hugo, Oklahoma, who came up to me in 1978 after complaining. I mean, I got booed when I put my bass amp on the stage at this bluegrass festival. And um, this guy came up after and said, hey, uh, the way you play the bass, it's almost like it's an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> That's like when somebody asked Jack Lawrence, is, uh, what, did, what did she say? Is that, is that an original? Or Jack said, oh, never mind. Edit that out. I can't remember the story. What did he say? Is that an original song or one I wrote? You're on your own, Brian, and you're I'm, dying. Oh, you're out dying. Is that, is that, is 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 that a real crash. song? Or is, this, is, he, is that a real song or one you wrote? Yeah. That's the, that's the Oh, guy. nice. Yeah, lady asked classic. Jack Lawrence, was that a real song or one you wrote? <laughs> there you go. Okay, you got it. Don't edit any of that out. All right. <laughs> Thank have, you, Tim. Have your take and edit, too. So you guys still adding songs to the repertoire, or are you pretty happy? With yeah. What you got? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, the making a new record a couple of years ago was a big impetus to um, get together and just uh, prove that that we can and find yeah. new songs and write new songs. And Brian really, you know, stepped up as a songwriter in a way that was was relatively new for him. And um, you know, we all we all contributed. And and I think the you know the idea that if you're out playing and people pay money to come and see you, there's a certain amount, you know, with a band that's been around for 40 years, there's a certain amount of nostalgia, there's a certain amount of association with the songs we've already, you know, gotten known for. Yeah. But there's also um, an expectation on our part not to be a, a Hot Rise cover band. You know, we're not just going to go play the same songs we, you know, play the same set list we played in, in 1982. So it's, it's better for us, and it's better for, in theory, for the audience to have some new stuff introduced, you know, regularly. Yeah. There's a great band playing bluegrass these days, has been for over a couple of decades, the Del McCurry Band. Sure. And they could stick completely to traditional bluegrass and kill it, just be incredibly great. But they're always coming up with new material, finding new material, writing new material. To me, that's very inspirational. And for, for our band, and we talked about this a lot, you know, we... We didn't want to just be known as a band that had a bunch of good material from the 80s, which we continue to do. We want to do that. You can't not do that. But to be alive as a band, you have to be taking on new things. And we've been, we not only made this record a couple of years ago, but we're, we're trying now to think of what else is new that we can continue to incorporate. It's great. Do you guys still uh, do rehearsals and everything? Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. We used to hardly ever rehearse because we were on the road so much. If we had a new thing going, we'd try it out at Soundcheck until it was ready to put in the show. And then we put it in the show, and there was, we would only rehearse maybe right before we're cutting a record where we wanted to get really nitpicky. But now, a lot of times, we have to get together to, you know, to hatch out new stuff. Yeah. You guys are all, aside from you, you're all kind of close together, right? Or no? No, I live in Nashville. Oh, you're in Nashville uh, too, along yeah. with, no, not in Brian's house, but in the same town. <laughs> same town, yeah. <laughs> I've sometimes lived in Brian's house for a couple of days at a time. So are the rehearsals <laughs> in Colorado or in Nashville, wherever they can be? Either. Yeah. Either place. Or yeah, elsewhere. Had, had them in Connecticut. We've had them in Tennessee, Rhode Island, wherever. Right. California. We did... Uh, so we, we have um, access to the building in Boulder called E-Town Hall. Yeah, your, your building. Yeah, so, so that's become a little bit of a hub for us, too, where that's where we cut the record. That's where we just we did a show there last week. And we've, we've been able to use that space as a sort of a staging ground um, to kind of work things up and, and try things out either with a PA or in the studio recorded. And, and uh, that's it's been a nice 
it's been a nice um, kind of focal point, and uh, we have a little a little guest house that sometimes Brian or Tim will stay in. So that's that's become a spot for us to still too. Yeah. Just a few days ago, we played four nights in a row. Three of them were at the Boulder Theater, and we had these guests, these fairly great musicians, <laughs> Jerry Douglas and Sam Bush and Stuart Duncan, and they all came out for the weekend and played with us, and we had uh, a lot of uh, fun with them, but uh, we also liked the idea of getting it down for a, a future video, future yeah. audio. So uh, uh, thanks to the E-Town crew, which it, it does a lot of video work and audio work, we preserved a lot of stuff, and we're going to be going through it and putting out stuff in the year 2018 to commemorate that uh, that celebration. Yeah. Well, since you brought up E-Town, I was going to ask you guys about your extracurricular activities. Um, Nick, you want to just start with E-Town and kind of give folks the description of what it is and what it's about? And oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it's a it's one. Of, it's all really because of Hot Rise. You know, we got a chance early on to play a bunch of radio shows, including Prairie Home Companion and uh, early on and Mountain Stage and Grand Ole Opry. We did a lot of TV shows too, but. Um, I had the mistaken impression that that would be pretty easy uh, to do, uh, to just create a radio show. Just because yeah. I just, oh, that doesn't seem so hard. You just get some people and record it. And, um, so in 90... It's 19, not easy? It's not that, <laughs> not that easy. So in 1990, um, I started working on it. In 1991, launched it mm-hmm. and uh, launched on NPR with about 40 stations. And now it's been on the air for 26 and a half years and... We've got about 300 radio stations that carry the show every week. And it's basically a variety show, a music variety show with a kind of a hippie vegetarian bent because we've been talking about our purpose was to talk about uh, individual efforts in communities around the country by people who are trying to you know, work on behalf of the greater good and mm-hmm. also try to stimulate conversation around renewable energy and climate change and sustainability. So we had that starting in 91. Um, and that's, uh, it's been a big endeavor and it's turned into be a, it's been a major focus for me for the last almost three decades. Um, and what's cool about it, aside from all the work and the logistics, is that I play in the house band. So I have opportunities, it's not obligatory, but I have ob- opportunities to support singer-songwriters or, or contribute musically to a huge array of artists who inspire me and um, it's a great honor and a musical challenge. Yeah. To, to kind of keep that going. Brian, what do you have going on? <clears throat> uh, well, you know, it's, I've spent a lot of the last 20 years, moved to Nashville in 1993, uh, just, you know, pursuing the Nashville session thing. And, and I'm, you know, happy to say that I, I feel like, you know, I kind of have seen that through. I feel for relative to that scene in that town and being a session player, I've been really fortunate. And uh, it seems like as the music business is changing and, and uh, I'm sort of changing focus. I do less, a lot less of that these days. I still, you know, am active. Uh, the shingle's still out, as it were. But I just do, do less of the session player for hire thing. Uh, I'm starting to produce a little more. It's not really where I want to throw all my energy, but I enjoy that. Yeah. You know, after years in the studio, you build a certain skill set and an awareness of how to make things happen. And to be able to offer that to people that, you know, want to go that extra mile of also my arrangement ideas and things like that I, I really enjoy that but I guess you know I've been touring more these guys have been touring more in the last few years and I've been on the road with my own thing that's what I get to what Nick said earlier of me jumping in as a writer on the most recent Hot Rise record that sort of also helped continue to spark more energy for my own songs and things that I wanted to do under my own energy with my own band and been doing more of that the last couple of years and we'll keep that up again I my my life is all about sort of compartmentalizing various amounts of energy to various amounts of things. One day I wonder what what might happen if I just do one thing. It'd be interesting. But anyway, lo- the other major part of energy for me over the last five years plus is the Artist Works uh, online teaching platform. Yep. Where I've got a bunch of good students around the world, and we talk about flat picking and how to how to get better. Yeah. How many students, Brian? I don't know, Nick. <laughs> Tim? <laughs> uh, well, Jason, you know, I, I, uh, I moved to Nashville in 96 and um, with the idea that I could support my family better from there than from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, it proved, proved to be a good move because I, I, I had in mind uh, writing songs and selling them to other people. So I've had small, a small number of cuts, but, but significant ones that have helped me out. And that's given me a license to just do what I want as a solo artist. And 
I've sort of, you know, played a lot of different kinds of music and, you know, a fair amount of Irish flavored music and some kind of honky tonky stuff, I suppose. But keep writing songs and that kind of thing. And then I, uh, I do a little production um, here and there. Um, uh, just, you know, I play with, I'm doing some more touring. Mostly I tour solo with, or in a duo with my partner Jan Fabricius singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just kind of, you know, always looking for the next thing. I've, I've got a bluegrass band now with uh, Patrick Sauber and Chad Cobb and Mike Bubb, which is really fun. And Jan singing the, the harmonies and uh, we're getting in the studio for that soon. Cool. Pete? Okay. Um, well, after Hot Rise uh, disbanded in 1990, uh, I decided to put together a band I'd been dreaming about which would have a clarinet in it and a vibraphone. I was inspired by people like Pete Fountain and uh, Gary Burton mm -hmm. and then bass and drums and uh, first we called it Pete Wernick's Live Five and then uh, because I call it mm -hmm. I call that flexigraphs music where it's basically bluegrass but with different instrumentation and some of the rules broken. A lot of my original material we added my wife, uh, Joan, as a singer, and the two of us also do a duet, so we, I get to perform in those kind of contexts, and I've been doing that, uh, well, the Flexigrass Band's been going for 25 years now, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy that as something different, and uh, that's for performing, that gives me some other outs, and, uh, but my biggest commitment now has been to various kinds of bluegrass education. I've been, uh, I have my Dr. Banjo Dot com website but uh, about seven years ago I realized that instead of doing banjo camps and all kinds of things based around teaching banjo technique I found the most important thing I have found for most people to learn is to be in a band or at least in a regular jamming situation and an amazing proportion of people who are very serious about playing instruments don't ever jam or hardly ever mm -hmm. jam and they don't really know the protocol so I developed a thing that's now called the Wernick Method. And I have a lot of instructions about how to teach bluegrass jamming, and we put it all together, and I certify teachers. We have well, about 100 certified teachers now. We're in almost all the United States, and we're in about 10 other countries. And uh, people are learning to jam, uh, and we get a lot of grateful feedback because uh, that really kind of helps them hang on as musicians and gives them motivation to practice, and people meet each other, and I think Bluegrass jamming is one of the finest things in the world. Yeah. Uh, for all kinds of good reasons, but it brings people together in a nice way. So I spent a lot of time overseeing the, the Wernick method. I call it sometimes the Jampire because it's my, my empire, Jam Empire. It's a Jam social empire. network. You made a social uh, yeah, network. We, yeah, we're even on Facebook and doing all kinds of things like that. But uh, it mostly it's just great to hear that people are really getting into it. We get wonderful feedback from the students. Yeah. Well, guys, I know you got to go to sound check. Thank you so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, nice Jason. To, nice to see where you live. And thanks. <laughs> yeah. And thanks also. I mean, I have to say that I think it was at an IBMA uh, quite a long time ago where we first came across this wacky magazine, Fretboard Journal, that just seemed to uh, it seemed so ambitious because it was so beautiful, and uh, I didn't understand it because it wasn't just riddled with advertising. <laughs> it was just like what the. How does this even exist in the universe? Well, now you're seeing the reality of yeah. how we exist. Well, I'm, I'm just telling you, it was a, it was a, it was recognizable, it was recognizable as a noble effort then, and uh, we all feel that it's, you know, you're doing a great job and, and providing a great service to a, a increasingly broad community of, of musicians. So, congratulations to you too. Thanks, guys. It's Absolutely. always exciting to get my fretboard journal. All right, no I matter when it shows up. <laughs> no matter when. <what. laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks.